friends, I want to just thank you for being with me today. And we are putting together this little video for you in our absence. I'm coming to you from the empty sanctuary at Midland Church, a, a very familiar spot for those of you who watch us week to week. And I'm doing this because we are actually on the road this weekend. As you are watching live, my wife and I are on our way back from Southern California. We've spent the weekend there ministering in a couple of different places, making some contacts with so many of our ministry friends. Many of you watching perhaps were even a part of those meetings. So I just want to send greetings to all of you, uh, whether you are um, in the U.S., uh, whether you're somewhere around the world, whether you are watching live or watching archive, we send grace greetings to you. It's a cold and rainy afternoon as I'm taping this, and it is winding into very slowly here in Missouri that time of year. Um, I say very slowly, but it's actually happening. It seems like it's happening quickly. That time of year where the days are shorter, uh, it's a little cooler, the leaves have turned, uh, and so uh, God is good. It's this, it's, weather is what it is, and everyone deals with theirs, but um, just giving you a little insight into what's happening in our neck of the woods. I just felt compelled as I started today to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to so many of you around the world who, number one, just believe in what we're doing, and you pray for us, and you lift us up before the Lord and you continue to push and promote the, the message and the ministry. I just want to say thank you for that. It is, we, we don't, we're not paying anybody to market, uh, paying you to market us. And yet people by word of mouth have helped this ministry to grow uh, at an amazing rate. And I just want to say thank you for all that you have done. Number two, for those who have supported us financially through the years. I'm standing here at Midland, and this is a place that has dedicated itself to the cause of the gospel of grace. But amazingly enough, probably half of the finances that we use on a day-to-day -day basis come from outside of this church. They come from viewers and listeners just like you. So I'm not asking you for anything. I'm just saying thank you. Thank you for partnering together with us to take the good news to people who are in need. You want to know what you're doing? You are affecting lives uh, and literally all over the world. God has blessed us with the, the opportunity to go to the other side of the globe a couple of times. And I have just been blown away at the number of people who are impacted day to day by the gospel of grace. And then in the U.S., I got a call today, in fact, in the office from someone who said, I've ordered every sermon you've ever preached and put on the internet uh, because the message of grace has totally transformed my life. You're making that possible. I just want to say thank you again for all that you do. Uh, today I'm going to minister to you for a few moments because it is very important to me that we continue to stir up the gift that is in us. What God has gifted me to do is to un- veil the loveliness of Jesus and in doing so remove the grave clothes of unrighteousness self-righteousness condemnation guilt shame off of God's people I feel a mandate to loose people and let them go I, I feel as if God has called us to be an evangelist to the evangelized and so it is with that in mind that I, when I'm leaving town now and we're going out to, to do meetings in other cities and around the world, rather than just not have a sermon, a new sermon that weekend on our website, we're doing these things where we get to greet you, but we also share something new. And I don't just go back and recycle material and say, eh, you know, we preached this a few months ago. Let's give it to the Internet audience. Uh, I go to the Lord and, and just say, Lord, what would you have me to say? And uh, I, I think that uh, some of it is familiar. I, I'm not saying that it's all brand new material, but it gets repackaged. And uh, we're going to do that today uh, as well. Uh, in fact, the, the key text today is going to come from the 10th chapter of Hebrews. And Hebrews 10 is a portion that we've spent significant time on right here on Wednesday nights. 
because I've been doing the verse by verse study through the book of Hebrews. But I don't want to go over the same material. I want to take it into an area that I feel the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding. It will also be very similar to some sermons we've done years ago, uh, sometime back. Uh, one, one, one sermon called Maintain a Good Confession. Um, and uh, we've done some others about your, about your speech. But I want, to, I want to title today Christianity, a Confessional Faith. And I want to get into what that means in a moment. Before I do, I want to pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the Word. I want to pray for our delivery of it and your reception of it. Father, I thank you because you're so good. I thank you that you have brought us together through the miracle of technology with your people today. And I'm asking you that you take this Word that is inside of us and that you stir it up and that you help us in delivering the word to your people. And I pray that, Lord, as they hear, that their hearts would be open and that they would receive a blessing. We're believing that the anointing, Father, is, is on us in the Holy Spirit all because of you. And we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do with this, both now and then whenever down the road that you see fit in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10 is where I'll take my text. And as I said a moment ago, uh, I, I dealt with this passage on a verse to verse basis um, right here a few Wednesday nights ago. But I, I didn't get into some of the things I want to get into tonight. Hebrews 10 verse 32. I'll read 32 through 35 uh, and then we'll stop and talk for a moment. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, the word illuminated is enlightened, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Now, the author is talking to a, a group of Christians, probably in the Roman synagogue, who have come out of a lifetime of Judaism and into the faith. And they are now being tempted to go back into the, the Mosaic system. And the, the, the temptation is probably more than anything most of us have ever encountered. It seems so simple. I, every time I think of this, I, I think, why would you ever go back to the, to the formula of a mosaic system when you have Jesus? But in their defense, and I don't want to stay on this too long, in their defense, they had, had spent a lifetime of loyalty to the law and loyalty to Moses. And to leave that to go to Jesus, whom they did not meet in the flesh, they didn't meet Moses in the flesh either, but to go from touching the sacrifice to not touching Jesus was a difficult transition for many of them. And because there was a Jewish exemption, exemption from Caesar, who said Jews do not have to declare that Caesar is God, they were taxed heavily for the benefit, but they didn't have to do it. Uh, Christians got no such benefit. Christianity was an illegal religion. So the, the Jews who were coming out of Judaism and into Christianity were faced with the dilemma of being persecuted in ways they had never been persecuted before because they wouldn't say Caesar, they, they, they wouldn't just say Yahweh is God or Caesar is God because they believed Jesus was God and Rome wasn't giving an exemption. So that's the backdrop. That's where the author is, at, is coming from when he says you, you're facing a persecution like you haven't faced before. And, and that leads us to the key, which is the 35th verse. Therefore, that's what the therefore is, therefore, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. And the word confidence is better translated out of the Greek, boldness in speaking. So think of it in these terms. Don't cast away your bold speech, which means that they had something verbal in their faith. And I want to take a moment and talk about my title because Christianity, a confessional faith. And when you see that title, I don't mean that Christianity is best defined by you confessing your faults to other people or 
this is very Catholic, the way that word confessional sounds, going to confessional, which is basically the Catholic version of receiving repent forgiveness of sins. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the literal act of using your mouth, talking, speaking, saying out loud who you are. You see, Christianity is not passive. And if, my, if we've got a danger in any way in the grace message right now with the way we're moving and the way we're functioning, the way we're operating, one of our danger zones could be a bit of passivity in our Christianity. We say, well, I'm saved. God's grace is good. God loves me. I don't have to do anything. This is a, a, a Christianity that's free of my performance. All of those things are amen and two thumbs up. But that can tend to lead us into this feeling of, I've got all of that. I don't do anything. God can do whatever he wants. And there's a dangerous precipice, I fear, in the grace camp of people having such passivity because they say God is sovereign. We just sit here. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. And I want to show you in this little lesson today that that is not only is it wrong, it's, it's flat out dangerous spiritually. And we're going to get into why. First of all, let's, let's start here. Confession. Using your mouth to say forth who you are and what he is and what he has done. And we're going to cover all that. Confession, in that sense, is not a work. Confession, in that sense, is a part of your faith. Think of it this way. Think of faith uh, as a two-sided coin. There's heads and there's tails on a coin, okay? Faith has two basic components, confession and belief. Most people, me included, because I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, as they say, if I were to try to define, to define faith, I would probably define it in the terms of it's what you believe. I'm, I'm being, very, being very shallow. We're not being theological at all here. Just very shallow definitions. Go, faith is believing something. Okay? Believing for something. Believing in something. Believing in something you can't see. Notice that in that definition, I didn't say anything about confession. I just said believing. Which is why we're getting a bit of passivity in the grace message because it's, we're, what we're saying is, well, all I got to do is believe. We go, well, how do you know they believed? Well, I don't know if they believed. Um, I think they believed. I don't have any way of being able to tell if they believe. And this leads us to this. Here's, here's the slope we're going down. Well, in that case, uh, who knows? Maybe they're saved. I don't know. Belief isn't something you can see. Uh, it's just something you have. And since all we have to do is have faith in order to activate God's grace... Who knows who's got it and who doesn't have it? That's a problem. It's a problem because Christianity is a confessional faith. It's not just a believing faith. It's a confessional faith. It doesn't do any good if I don't give you some scripture. Let's do that. Romans chapter 10. I want to jump into the Romans road. Uh, and what I mean by the Romans road is for those who have ever been trained on how to evangelize their neighbor or their friend, uh, the Romans road is, is widely considered the way to lead someone to Jesus. And you go through different passages in the book of Romans. And one of those passages is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. I want to read verse starting in verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So Paul says, first of all, that he preaches the word of faith. When I say word of faith, in the 21st century, a lot of you came out of Pentecostal and charismatic churches that would have categorized themselves as word of faith. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. You don't have to know the, the, the terminology or the, the divisions of Christianity vis-a-vis -vis the 20th century. That's not important. What is important is that out of that word of faith came uh, some awesome teaching on how to say who you are and how to confess the proper confession. 
Unfortunately, as we so often have the habit of doing, we take beautiful things and we run them in the ground and we take them too far and often take them out of balance. And so uh, the word of faith doctrine, quote unquote, was abused by people who made their faith, they put their faith in their faith. They put their faith in their ability to memorize scripture or to quote the right verse or to a thousand and one things. So when you see the phrase word of faith, it didn't originate with some preacher in the 20th century. It originated with Paul, who said he preaches the word of faith. So what is the word of faith? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I'm in verse 9, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Did you see that? Verses 9 and 10 give you the, the complete framework of salvation by faith. It really gave you the two sides to the same coin. In your heart, verse 10, in your heart you believe unto righteousness. With your mouth confession is made unto salvation. These are the two sides of faith. So while I am a firm believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ being received by faith and the grace of God being activated by faith. But, and what I mean by, by faith is believing on Jesus, only believe. I'm also a firm believer in the power of confessional faith, saying aloud who you are. And I think it'll solve a little bit of this dilemma that this slippery slope, as I said a moment ago, that we're in of saying, well, who's in? Who's, who's a believer? And we go, I don't know who the believer is because they, you can't tell by looking. Well, you can't tell by looking because they've been made righteous in their heart. With their heart, they believe unto righteousness, but with their mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And so that's that part of our salvation that we need, we need to remember. This is, there's no room for passivity. P plain and simple, there's no room for us to just receive, sit, get all the benefits, and never have to believe. We rest, we receive, but there's an element to that rest that is so important for a new covenant believer. First Timothy chapter six, I want to talk for a moment about being active rather than being passive. Paul writes, and most everybody's familiar with Paul's little letters first and Paul's little letters to Timothy. We call them first and second Timothy, though they're not written by Timothy. He comes to the end, the last few verses of the first letter, first Timothy six. And he's talking to Timothy about maintaining a good confession. And there's a lot of good stuff here. And I don't, want to, I don't want to get into too much. But I want to give you the basic of what Paul is saying. He says this in verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which... You were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Notice in the same context as fighting the fight of faith is maintaining a good confession. And just like Hebrews 10.35, hold on to your confidence, your boldness in speaking. Maintaining a confession is the fight of faith. I've had people ask me, what do you think Paul meant when he said, fight the good fight of faith? Does that mean we're out fighting the devil? What is Paul talking about? I believe what Paul is talking about is you have laid hold. These are these all three in the same verse. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, uh, and maintain a good confession. So I think they're all the same thing. They're all part and parcel of the same thing. When you believed on Christ, you laid hold of eternal life. How you continue to lay hold of it, and I'm using my hand on this little, this little podium. How you lay hold on it is maintain a good confession. So as you confess who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, as you confess that, 
you are laying hold of eternal life and through that you're fighting the good fight of faith. If someone has spoken prophetic words over you, New Testament prophetic words into your life, and they have blessed you and motivated you and built you up, don't just passively uh, say, well, God's got to do it. I don't, you know, it either happens or it doesn't happen. Continue to believe them. Continue to quote them. Continue to rehearse them. Continue to confess them. Speak aloud who you are. That's fighting the good fight of faith. Don't be passive. Be active. Again, this is not a work. I've got to please God in order to be. No, 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 no. I didn't say that uh, you have to scream it out loud so God remembers it. No, you're, you're fighting an enemy who wants you to forget who you are. Plain and simple. He really doesn't have any other power. He's been defeated by Christ. He just wants you to forget who you are. If he can convince you that God's a liar, that God is withholding information from you, that God is ticked off, that you have done too much, you have went too far. If he can convince you of these things, then he wins the battle and he didn't even, he didn't even swing a sword. He's a defeated foe who cannot beat you on straight up honest terms. And so he has to lie to you about your place and your condition. And he has to give you some of the things we've preached over the last few weeks. Uh, he has to convince you that you're separated. We, we did the sermon illusion of separation. He has to convince you that you made vows that you didn't keep and thus God is separated. We, we preach deliverance from the rash vow. He has to convince you of, of lies. So fighting the good fight of faith is simply holding on to the eternal life provided to you through your good confession. It started when you believed, and, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so as you've done that, you, you begin to rest in who you are. Don't just fall asleep. <laughs> Awake, realize that you're righteous, grab hold of eternal life, and continue to believe. Now, the enemy is going to use the evidence around you to convince you of things that are, that are not true. He's always been very good. I, don't, I hate giving him any credit, but he's always been very good at causing people to stop looking inside and start looking outside. He did it in the Garden of Eden. He has, he's dealing with Adam and Eve who are perfect. They've never even, they've never even sinned. They are the very likeness and image of God and Satan comes to them and causes them to lust after an illusion he lies and says if you would eat the tree you would be like God they were already like God if they wanted to know that they didn't need to look at a tree they just needed to look inside but he took their eyes off of the and I'm going to use the wrong phrase, but you'll know what I mean. He took their eyes off of the Christ that was in them. I know Christ wasn't, Christ wasn't in them, but they were the image of God. So in New Covenant terms, you know where I'm going. He took their eyes off of that, put it onto a tree, and then convinced them that if they ate that, they could have something they didn't already have. So the lie was in causing them to believe something that was not true. He used the evidence, which was, hey, look at that tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know why that's there? It's because you don't have the knowledge of good and evil. And if you'll eat that tree, you'll have what you don't have. And he convinced them, and you know the story. It was all downhill from there. The enemy, I'm going to try to say this just the way I see it in my spirit. The evidence in your life may say, God has left me. Where, where is God? He's nowhere to be found. He's not, he's not in my marriage. He's not in my children. I don't see him in my wallet right now. I'm not seeing God doing the things that God's supposed to do. And out of our mouth, we are speaking the evidences 
around us. We think we're being very honest. It looks bad. I'm just going to say it like it is. But the currency of heaven, you pull your wallet out and pull out a $10 bill or whatever and you go get $10 worth of goods in the United States. With that, that's legal tender is what they call that. So you can buy $10 worth of goods. That's the currency of the United States of America is the U.S. dollar. The currency of the heavenly realm is what? People would say faith. Faith, the, if, faith is you taking the currency of the heavenly realm and laying it on the counter. But faith is not the currency of the heavenly realm. God's currency is God's spoken word. God, who at sundry times and in various manners hath spoken to us by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God has already spoken to us through Jesus. The word is sharp, quick, more powerful than any two-edged sword. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I know we're just rattling off scriptures about the word. The word of faith which we preach, that if a man believes in his heart, he believes unto righteousness, but if he confesses with his mouth, he is saved. The evidence appears that God is gone. The currency of heaven is what God has said. So in the middle of the evidence, find the currency. Hebrews chapter 13. We haven't made it this far in our verse by verse, as we're doing that on a weekly basis, but... It's still worth going to today. Hebrews 13 and 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? <laughs> I want you to catch it. Ah, when I read it, I get excited. I want you to see two things. Number one, what did he say? Number two, now what do you say? Okay, number one, what did he say? For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The evidence says God's not here. God doesn't care about me. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The currency of heaven, the cash money of heaven is what God says. What did God say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that, here's number two, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Ha! Think about it. God said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So we can say, the Lord is my helper. No matter what you go through in life, God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So that you can say, it doesn't matter if it doesn't look good. It doesn't matter if the evidence is against me. It doesn't matter if uh, I don't feel it. My emotions are low. The Lord is my helper. I say to you right now in the name of Jesus, the Lord is your helper. I'm not proclaiming it because I think it. I'm only saying what I'm allowed to say because of what God has already said. What God has already said is, I will never leave you for, nor forsake you. And using the currency of heaven, I have a confessional faith. The Lord is my helper. People may say, well, it doesn't look like God's helping. It doesn't even look like God cares. I have the right as a believer. And let me just say, I have the right as a Christian. Some people seem to be backing off of Christian because it's like they are afraid of the connotation. All right, connotation away. Christian. Those who think Christ lives in us. Ah, well, I'm crazy enough to believe that, that Christ lives in me. If he never leave me or forsake me, I have the right to say, the Lord is my helper. That's, you got to know what he says. You want to know why, let me take my Bible. You want to know why it's important to read this? If you don't read it, you'll go to heaven. <laughs> um, I got up in a, in a conference recently. I wasn't even really thinking about it. Just, it just flowed. The Holy Spirit, I opened my mouth and he, he came out. And after you hear what I said, you might disagree and say, don't blame that on the Holy Ghost. But I got up and said, it feels so good to be free from reading my Bible. 
it feels so good to be free from prayer. And the, there was an atmosphere in the room of anticipation, as you can tell, as you can imagine. And then I ministered. It is for freedom that he set me free. I live under the law of liberty. I love reading the word, but I'm so glad to be free from the obligation of reading the word. I'm so glad to be free from the obligation of having to pray at a certain time or pray for so long. I'm so glad to be free from the obligation of having to try to be good and always do the right thing. I want to be good in his eyes through the righteousness that's in me through Christ. But I'm so glad to be freed from all of those other things. And the people, that resonated so much with that audience. They, you could feel them feeding on that statement. And I, and I, and so I, and I still stand by that. I'm, I'm so thankful to be free from those obligations. But why do we read it? We read it because we, in it we learn what God says. And what God says is what gives me the right to say what I say. And you the right to say what you say. So if you don't ever read it, if you don't ever read your Bible, and you don't ever hear preaching, uh, then you're probably not hearing this. <laughs> but if, so if anybody ever asks you about this, you can say, if you don't ever read and you don't ever listen, you will still be a believer as long as you believe on Jesus and you still have the benefits of heaven. The problem is you won't know anything about them. So you won't confess them. You won't believe for them. And thus, you won't walk in them. And this is why I don't agree with some grace people who think, well, you put faith in Christ, you can just sit back and let God do it all. We have a confessional faith. He said it, thus we say it. Let's go to one more. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 13. This is right after the, the famous chapter where Paul, famous to a lot of us grace people who we like to establish freedom from the letter of the law. And Paul uses the third chapter to talk about the ministry of death. Fourth chapter, 2 Corinthians 4 and 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Look at 13 again, one more time. What is written? I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Paul says, we only speak because we believe. What's the purpose? Who cares? Why speak at all? I mean, if you already believe, why speak? Because we know that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. And so what happens is we confess what we know to be true so that thanksgiving begin to abound in our heart and God receive the glory. So as we spend the currency of heaven, and remember, the currency of heaven is what God has said. As we spend the currency of heaven, and that would have been a good title for this message too, um, if Christianity is a confessional faith, what are we confessing? We're confessing what God has said about us. Uh, as we do that, we bring glory to who, to who God is. I want to close it out with talking about the spirit of faith for a moment. Look at it again in the, thir in the 13th verse. Since we have the same spirit of faith, when we speak the confessional faith in our Christianity, we are speaking the spirit of faith, the language of of faith. Let's contrast really simple terms, the old and the new. Old Testament, God gives commandments to be obeyed. New Testament, God gives promises to be inherited. I know I could have said received, and I have many times, but I really want to say inherited because there's a difference in obedience and inheritance that's even more stark, perhaps, than obedience and reception. 
inheritance is accessible by faith only. There can be no mixture in what we receive by inheritance and what we receive by obedience. This is why you can tithe and tithe and tithe and tithe and not see a financial blessing. Because you are trying to mix a lawful obedience from the Sinai covenant with faith accessible through the new covenant. And you can say, yes, I'm giving, but I believe in it. And you will not be blessed because you're tithing any more than you would be blessed if you went and bought a lamb, slit its throat, poured the blood over an altar in your backyard and said, okay, God, this is for my sins. <laughs> you, you could say, well, God told us to do that. I'm just, the difference is, pastor, I'm putting faith with it. I'm going to kill that lamb with faith. You cannot mix faith with obedience. It's why the old covenant shut up faith. That was, Paul said it was shut up until Christ. Uh, and the law was our schoolmaster. When you speak the confessional faith, we're not talking about putting a little faith, speaking some faith over your works. This is very crucial. I got to close this way. We're not talking about adding some faith to your actions. What a lot of Christians have done is they are work, 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 work oriented in the body of Christ, but they'll say the difference is we do it in faith. Really, we do it in faith. We do the same exact things that people do without faith and our faith makes the difference. That, I hope you realize the insanity of performance and then throw in some faith on top of it and say, no. We believe that Christ has finished the work. We confess what he has finished. We maintain that confession. As our opening text said in Hebrews 10, 35, we hold fast our confidence, that's our boldness in speaking, because we know that the enemy is out to get us to be convinced otherwise. You have a confessional faith. You have two sides to the faith coin. You have believed on Jesus. Now maintain your confession about who he is. It's time to start doing this in our marriages and over our children and in our finances and in our lives. I'm not talking about calling things in, into existence that are not as though they were. That's God's job. I'm talking about spending the currency of heaven, figuring out what God said, and then maintaining our confession. You want to know the real fight of faith? The real fight is to maintain your boldness in speech about who you are in Christ. Father, I'm believing that you're going to take this word and drop it into the hearts of, our, of your people, of our audience. And that, Father, we're going to go from just having Christianity as a belief, we're going to have a confessional faith to where we maintain our boldness of speech because of who we are in Christ. And I'm praying favor into the lives of every person that hears this word. I'm praying that, Father, they walk in the free favor of God, that they receive that as part of their inheritance, and that they learn to say it aloud today, this week, that they are what the Bible says they are. And we believe there's benefits from, that, from, from doing that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.